Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. We are here to discuss uh, terrorism in the digital age. We have six, uh, or indeed five, enormously um, uh, experienced and knowledgeable commentators and an engaged audience and one hour, so it will be a challenge. Um, historically, as we know, terrorists have used fairly primitive tactics in order to get our attention. They simply can plant a bomb and exploit our media, uh, and rely on our media, our sophisticated media, to spread the word and spread the terror they're trying to instill. Um, they haven't needed high te new technologies or high-level high technologies. They've been able to exploit their weakness. Because they've been weak, they've been poor, they haven't needed much in the way of technology. But as we know, technology is becoming cheaper by the day and falling into the hands of terrorists. And so we're, our, the particular point we want to explore today is how is the digital age affecting contemporary terrorism? How are terrorists using the digital media to forge connections uh, and to enhance their strength? Secondly, how can we exploit our greater access to technology to counter them effectively? And if we have time, we'll then move on to trying to imagine um, how terrorist use of technology is likely to evolve in the future. So to help us address these questions, we have a, an enormously distinguished panel, as I said. To my immediate left, we have His Excellency President Yem, uh, Professor Yemi Osimbayo, who is the Vice President of Nigeria. To his left, we have Mr. Rob Rainwright, who is Director of Europol. Um, next to Rob, we have um, His Royal Highness Prince Turkey Al Faisal Al Saud, who is the chairman of the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies in Saudi Arabia. We have General uh, Rahil Sharif, who until recently was chief of staff of the Pakistani army. And finally, Mr. Jean-Paul Laborde, who is assistant secretary general and executive director of counterterrorism at the United Nations in New York. So perhaps I could start with you, Your Excellency. Um, what do you think, uh, how do you think and Lord knows your government has had a great deal of experience in countering terrorism. Has the digital age affected how terrorists have operated and how they have forged international links mm -hmm. in Nigeria? Oh, yes, certainly. Uh, I think, you know, that, of course, you know, on a general level, the ability of terrorists to quickly uh, connect and uh, to interact very quickly is one that has been you know, vastly enabled by digital technology. But, but, but for us, it's, it's perhaps even uh, a little uh, less uh, sophisticated, a little less uh, dramatic. Uh, just yesterday, um, in a university, a Boko Haram, um, uh, there was a Boko Haram attack, a bomb attack on the university. And what had simply happened was that there were two children one by the age, possibly about the age of 12, another possibly even younger, a girl and a boy, who were obviously kitted with, uh, with, with, with explosives. And the explosives were detonated remotely. And that's what we believe would be were detonated remotely. And that's happened before. Now, the use of mobile telephony to enhance um, uh, the, 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 these kinds of the, these kinds of bombs and and to detonate these kinds of bombs uh, has again uh, turned things around in, in in terms of what we should be looking out for and how we should be uh, how we should be fighting you know especially uh, suicide bombings and those kinds of things because again here are young children they obviously do not even know what's going to happen next and they are re really just sent as human bombs and um, then uh, the, these things can be detonated. Now, that would, not have, that would have been very difficult many years ago, but now everyone has access to you know, uh, smartphones, everyone has access to phones, and even sometimes online, people learn to use these kinds of devices, all, all of these IEDs and several other types of devices. So I think at, at every level, at the very sophisticated uh, level, and, and at those relatively low levels, the, the challenge is, is significant. Thank you. Um, yes, I'd agree. I think Daesh is using technology and the internet in ways that we've never seen a terrorist group used before, and to such an extent that at least what we see in Europe, and of course we all know that Europe has suffered greatly from terrorism, especially in the last two years, is that uh, 
it's become part of the battleground, I think, now, uh, on the front line for fighting terrorism. Um, firstly, because of the scale that we're dealing with, Twitter alone uh, removing some quarter of a million accounts connected <laughs> with Daesh in a little over a year. Um, and of course, not just Twitter. What we found at Europol through our European Counterterrorism Center is some 90 different social media platforms uh, that that terrorist group is, is using in a highly enterprising, flexible way. Difficult, therefore, to contain it with uh, such flexibility and resilience like that. The speed of it, you know, we're seeing one million hits on a very professionally made video, so-called celebrating the attacks on Paris uh, just over a year ago. One million hits within 36 hours as well. So the technology is advanced. Uh, they know what they're doing. They know how to use it and why they're using it, of course, mainly for communication purposes. It's acting as effectively an echo chamber uh, to spread their, their, their radical beliefs, of course, in a way to recruit, firstly, more and more followers, to recruit impressionable, in the main, young men, uh, to incite them to carry out so-called lone actor attacks. And many of the attacks that we've suffered in Europe in recent times can be directly connected, I think, to the process by which this ugly propaganda has turned their heads, but also recruitment of foreign terrorist fighters who have then gone to the region to, to join uh, Daesh as well. Some recent innovations just as worrying, you know, the first examples, at least in Europe, of live streaming of attacks. Uh, so, you know, it's, that in itself, I think, promotes a certain attraction, at least within the minds of some people as well. And we saw that for the first time when the police officer and his wife was killed in Manionville uh, in the summer of, of, of last year. Of course, better known, I think, and better established also with other groups like Al-Qaeda is the extent to which technology is used for communication purposes, and encryption especially. Uh, that's not such an innovation by ISIS, uh, Daesh, but it's uh, still something that's a, that's a major feature. And finally, as a financing operation, you know, some innovative crowdfunding operations that are, that are being uh, used by some members of the, of the group as well. So in many, many ways, seeing technology in the social and digital age that we've never seen before, as I said, putting it on the front line of the fight against terrorism. Thank you. And what about the situation in Saudi Arabia? Do you think this is similar, or are you facing different issues? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is pretty much universal, what my predecessors talked about. If I can describe terrorism as, as a cancer, where the terrorist cell uses these modern methods to metastasize and to affect the rest of the body, uh, that is how uh, the modern technology is, is being used today. In the 60s and the 70s, when Europe and the rest of the world was going through another period of terrorism, red brigades, the, all the various, Bader Meinhof, etc., the lack of these facilities that they have today kept them pretty much within a certain uh, borderline, if you like. Uh, now it is universal. Um, a hit in Paris is reflected by a million strikes, as this gentleman said, from everywhere. And also, so it's not just the, the technology, but the fact that it is available uh, to these people and very much with, within the hand, the hands, uh, handheld uh, cell phone. That makes it very easy to use and very, very uh, much uh, a menace uh, to the rest of uh, society. But uh, one other thing I think uh, that people should keep in mind is that uh, the terrorists are much, much, much quicker in action uh, than those who counter them um, because of these tools that they have in their hands and because they have no responsibility to a hierarchy above them, uh, governments are. And so the communication within governments limits the speed with which the governments can respond uh, to the, uh, the terrorists. So this gives them another advantage, that they can act almost instantaneously. And if you have live streaming, well, then you have even uh, a quicker way uh, and a more current way of uh, not only uh, showing what you do, but also recruiting and um, uh, propagandizing and, and all of that. 
General Sharif, you've been in the front line of countering terrorism. Do you, do you think these advantages that we've heard that terrorists have, the ability to act quickly and to use these uh, new methods of communication, give them an advantage? It gives them a huge advantage. And I must agree with my panelists. Uh, it's uh, not only a cancer, it's the most deadly cancer. And I personally feel these uh, terrorists have the ability to mutate, to morph, and uh, they can do that very quickly. And obviously, uh, this platform of uh, digital age that is available, whether it is social media or any other platform which is available, they use it very, very effectively. And uh, recruitment is one thing which uh, is done on that. And I think uh, the financiers, the betters, the facilitators, uh, the sleeper cells, and the sympathizers, all of them are involved in this. And um, I totally agree with His Highness, you know, there's a requirement to, uh, for the free world to gel together and to react uh, in, a, in, a, in such a fast pace. I would like to say that we need to go on a search to get rid of this menace. And they plan their attacks very well. They want glorification. If you see the timings, if you see the choice of, uh, of uh, the targets, it, it, there's a method to this madness. It's not that somebody from the cave is just planning it. It's much more to it. And uh, they have been very, very successful in it. And I think we have been uh, late in time. But if I just say a few words about uh, my country, Pakistan and the region, we were having around 150 odd incidents uh, a month. And uh, from that, we came down to a single figure in 2016. And now, with the help of God Almighty, we have one odd incident in one or two months. So from bit to bit, you know, or you can say from hours to days to weeks and to months. And there we are in months. And I'm sure we'll have that first one year. But as you said, it's a very, very deadly thing, and we all need to put our uh, F act together and react against it. Thank you very much. And the perspective from the UN, I, I imagine you have less in the front lines countering them um, with force and more at the political end, is that right? Well, I, ca I can see here, you have already one, two, three, four regions of the world. And almost the same constatations that communication, they are excellent in communication, <coughs> terrorist uh, organizations, um, and, and then they use the di digital for that. Operations, depending on the countries you have, uh, for example, what the, the vice president <coughs> said, well, it's not as sophisticated as it is in Daesh, but they used to detonate, so they use a different way. Um, and then Pakistan is a country in which you had this type of also phenomenon, which was eff effectively reduced, uh, as you said, General, under your leadership. And um, operations are also very close to digital. Uh, many operations of, of uh, Daesh were conducted through uh, messaging, I mean, the instructions, and then after the detonation, and et cetera. So, and finally, I think the financing which is also very important for me. And the financing also shows us that uh, the terrorist organizations are not only terrorist organizations. Mainly now they are also very much linked with uh, organized crime. For example, the, do you know that the resources of Daesh, just an example, come from five to seven percent, between five and seven, depending on the assessment, from drug trafficking. What happens in Afghanistan? A huge amount of uh, funds come from the drug trafficking also. So don't forget these links. And at the, at the level of the UN, we have not forgotten that. What was said also, and this is a final point, we are always a step behind. And because terrorism is a global threat, which uh, requires a comprehensive answer. I will take the example, of, for example, of uh, international cooperation. We have not to be a step behind. And we have to use this type of uh, digital age to fight them the same way that they find us. It, I know that it is difficult 
because also they, we have to do that through under the umbrella of the rule of law, and, and this is what also something is difficult, but we have to do that, and we have, this is why the only way to go is really to have a very solid and good international cooperation network. And this is where the UN, I think through the Security Council, but also through the center, uh, the UN Center on Counterterrorism, should really uh, um, be uh, the repository of good practices give to the country, hey, you have done that, for example, on the, on the borders, I just spoke with the general on the borders, Pakistan has done a, a very important work, on Boko Haram, you have done um, in, in, in the issue of uh, the uh, foreign terrorist fighters also. So that's what has to be uh, shared, exchanged. And um, during the next round, I will explain how to do that. Oh, well, Thank you. you've, you've got to start now then. Why, let's face it, international cooperation has not been that effective against no, terrorism. Why no. not? Why not? First of all, because I feel that the countries should be, excuse me, I, I speak from the, uh, I used to be a judge in my Supreme Court in, in my country, so I feel that we are not disciplined enough to have the type of offenses which can really be connected to each other, to each other. I mean that that's something very technical, but also very practical. We have to use the conventions against terrorism, which are the ones of the UN, to have at least a, an understanding about what we, what we want to face. For example, explosive. Okay, fine. The terrorist by explosive. That's, that's what that. Let's have an offense in the countries which could be the same, or at least similar in many countries. Second, we have also to work with the companies, which is also something very new for us. I mean, it's normally security was in the past the, uh, I mean, the prerogative of, of states. No, now we have to work and we have engaged with all the big companies of the world now to work with them to see what they can provide, for example, the prosecutors, what they can give freely, not even speaking about the uh, freedom of speech or uh, privacy, what they can give uh, uh, without infringing all of that. And also what we have to do is to, uh, in my view, also to, uh, to speak with the civil society. Because you will not fight terrorism from only a state or a company perspective. This is a triptych that you have to have. Civil societies, companies, and state. We don't work against, against the people. We work for the people. And at the end of the day, uh, we know very well that uh, states, uh, companies, and civil societies are victims of this phenomenon. This is what we do. May I say May I just yes, please. One, one yes. 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 Absolutely right, because uh, in Pakistan also, it was a whole of nation approach. Yes. And I think uh, that that, uh, that paid. We had some very horrendous mm -hmm. attacks, like the school incident, in which you know over 135 children were killed, so and martyred. So we we everybody came together and gelled together. So it, I think at the international level also there is a requirement to have synergy in effect and to have uh, a platform. And uh, UN resolution like 1373 says it all. You know everybody has a responsibility. And I think uh, as you said, you know uh, about the digital age, and I think. Uh, Intelligence sharing is key to success against uh, terrorism. And that, that's very, very important. And if there is uh, intelligence shared and there's actionable intelligence and people work on it, the countries react to it, I think it can bring in a marked difference. Intelligence sharing, though, I think is one of the main stumbling blocks in the fight against terrorism. I don't know if things have changed since I was in intelligence. But there was always the third person rule about sharing intelligence. That is, if I share intelligence with you, you're not allowed to share it with your neighbor unless you come back to me and ask me if you can share it. And that puts a, a, a big constriction on the immediacy of the sharing of the, of the intelligence. So this counter-terrorism center in the UN, I think, is very important in overcoming some of these bureaucratic obstacles as well as some of the financial obstacles that face countries in general and the human resource obstacles. There are many countries, in the, if you look at, for example, some of the Sahel countries in Africa, they lack 
human resources and they lack financial resources uh, to meet the challenge of, of, the, of these terrorists. And by the time that a world response comes to help these countries, it may be too late. They already established there. They have found their own uh, place and so on. Another factor, of course, uh, is the, what we're facing in our part of the world, uh, which is the failed states. If you take the situation in Syria, for example, or in Iraq, or in Yemen, the state is no longer capable of meeting these challenges. In Pakistan, they have done well for themselves, as the general mentioned. They brought down the incidents from several a year to less than one, and perhaps will be improving further. So there is a need by the world community to look into how the failed states can be brought back to meet these challenges. Your Excellency, we're hearing a lot about international cooperation and mobilizing all facets of society in the counter-terrorist um, campaign. Has this been mm. your experience in Nigeria too? Have you been getting mm. the international collaboration you'd like? Um, yes, to, to a very large extent. I mean, we work with the Lake Chad Basin uh, countries and uh, other uh, frontline countries around our zone, around our region. Um, but, uh, for, for, for me, I, I, I think there is a, you know, I think in, in developing a response, I think um, there is a need to work on how to you know, delegitimize ideology that is so uh, potentially so dangerous. And frankly, I think, uh, yes, a, a great deal of attention needs to be spent on how to deal with the technical issues around uh, controlling uh, information that gets into cyberspace and all of that. But I think that there must be counter information. There must be some information out there that delegitimizes these kinds of ideologies. And uh, I, I think a lot more time needs to be spent on that. The other thing is, the, is, is really the autonomy that um, uh, that each person has, each person who has a digital appliance, a digital device, is you know has tremendous power, you know, and um, you don't even require any, of, as you know, any formal agreements. I mean, just putting out your information out there, it can reach large numbers of people. How to deal with, you know, how to deal with it? Because this is a peculiar, it's a new. Uh, is absolutely new, and we have to ask ourselves, how do you deal with those issues where, you know, one person can can do so much harm, you know, by just simply putting out uh, uh, the kind uh, this, this kind of information uh, out there? I think that we are, I think that we are really uh, in a in, in a place that uh, obviously the world has never been before, but but our responses must be must be new. They must be nuanced because again, I'm look at issues of freedom of expression, you know, and how that in some senses has affected the way that we're approaching this. We're very we're restrained, you know. We're walking gingerly around uh, international human rights rules and and of course freedom of expression and those kinds of things, because that's how that's that that's how we've been. We've been, you know, to use the expression brought up. But we, we simply have to take, you know, a second look at all of those kinds of issues. We have to take a second look. What is freedom of expression today? I mean, obviously, we're, we're seeing it being approached in uh, legislation on terrorism, anti terrorism legislation, and all of that. But I think there's still a broader uh, conversation to be had as to how to look at the whole question. Of, I mean, freedom of expression. When uh, you have these kinds of challenges, how how does that play out? How do you how do you deal with these issues? And there must be consensus. There must be international consensus. Otherwise, I mean, you're going to have uh, rogue rogue behavior in so these things. Are you saying there's a conflict between freedom of expression and uh, countering terrorism effectively? The, the point I'm really making is that. Our freedom of expression traditions and, and, and our whole orientation affects our thinking about how to deal with, uh, with, with, with terrorism, with terrorism, especially you know uh, cyber terrorism. I think that we are restrained. I, I, I don't. I, I think that we are, of course, you know, 
this, this, this is the way we've always thought about these things. As a matter of fact, time was when someone would say that even if it was what is described today as hate speech, it is still, it is still permissible so long as um, it wasn't libellous, so long as it was. And, and, and countries where strict rules applied about, um, about uh, hate speech, uh, sedition, and those kinds of things, that, 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 that was old school. But all of a sudden, you know, we're finding that we've got to rethink what we've got to rethink our way, and I think it's just more a mindset. Um, I'm not, uh, and I think that there's a need for us to just deconstruct that so that we can be more open-minded about dealing with the issues of count of, of terrorism. Uh, about that, Please. about that, we have uh, exactly on this on this issue, upon the initi initiative of EGI, by the way. Uh, who was the president of the Security Council. At that time, we have launched uh, an initiative which is uh, an international framework on counter-narrative and to understand exactly what could be done on this issue. That's something very important, of course, obviously. And, uh, and uh, it has to be done again with all the elements of the society, all the uh, elements that we can uh, get, and also uh, the private companies. This is why, by the way, the uh, work of the forum on the cyber security also is so important. And I, I have to praise the, the work of uh, the group led by Jean-Luc Vess about that, because it's, it's a very uh, an important work on this issue. This must be something no. the Europol thinks a lot about, how to delegitimize an ideology, how to have a new and nuanced approach. Do you think it's possible to construct an effective counter-narrative? Yeah, well, it's, it's essential and, it, and it's part of the Europeans, European Union agenda in this space as well, of course. Um, but we have to deal with it in a way to reconcile what are uh, contradictory forces. You know, we want to enjoy, we want to protect the freedom of the internet, but not to such an extent that there are absolutely no rules of governance uh, and, and no effective means by which law enforcement and other security agencies can monitor and indeed and prevent terrorist activity. Uh, and going back to the point that the General and His Royal Highness were making earlier, I think there are other contradictory forces which are, are at play in dealing with the modern manifestations uh, of, of, of terrorism. You're right, General, it's, it requires an all of national response, but actually the extent to which terrorism operating today on the internet, exemplified by that, means it has to be more than that. It has to be an all of region, indeed all of global response. And yet, for very good reasons, of course, terrorism is a national security issue that roots it very much in political, legal, operational terms in something that's within the, the geographical boundaries of a state. And indeed, in the European Union, we have political red lines, we have legal red lines in our treaties that make sure that that is the case. So how do you reconcile that and the need to protect intelligence very closely and be very careful about sharing it with the fact that you're facing something that's become, long since become, a regional global challenge. That's the gap, the policy gap that we have to bridge through pretty smart solution. And what we do at Europol is try to leverage the extent we can build trust within the counter-terrorist and policing communities. Uh, and, in this, and in this space of the digital age, operate as a single platform to coordinate police activity and make referrals to all of these social media platforms. So there is a way of doing it, but it's, it's about reconciling separate interests sometimes in, 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 in a modern and, and smart way. Yeah, I, please. Uh, when I was referring to this whole of nation approach, obviously I just gave an example and you were absolutely right. It has to be at the international level. And I'll, I'll say that uh, <clears throat> these uh, freedom uh, of speech and uh, you know um, other things like uh, human rights and all, they are, uh, they are uh, limitations and uh, they are uh, difficult to handle when you are dealing with hardcore terrorists. And if you talk of human rights, I'll just give an example again of uh, about uh, 100 odd mothers whom I met after the incident myself, my wife, we were there, and uh, they were all demanding that they should be caught and uh, apprehended and hanged there in the school premises. So somebody mentioned about human rights, so they just literally got hold of me and said that, what about our human rights? So there, there, there is a balance which is required, and especially for those, uh, I would say, hardcore 
terrorists who have been holding heads of two of my soldiers, you know, one in each hand, and playing football with the third one. So there is there is there is a need to you know deal with these terrorists in a very firm, in a very bold, audacious, and I personally feel in a manner that uh, it creates deterrence. Obviously, the norms and other rules and regulations need to be followed, but I think that's the way forward for those who, and, and then the second point, obviously, the counter-narrative, that is very, very important. In fact, the same vehicle which they are using, I personally feel we should be using it better than that. And this counter-narrative should be, should be going out uh, day in, day out, and all our youth and, uh, you know, uh, the people who get radicalized or who get impressed and all, must, this narrative should be so potent, so strong, that it should nullify everything. You, it's, 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 sorry to interrupt, it's fake news. It's, it's effectively an example of this phenomenon that, that we're dealing with now. Maybe we need to have a, a tweetified response to it, because it is just fake news. Mm -hmm. and, and the same challenge around how, how we can <coughs> identify it and, and, and persuade our, 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 our peoples that it is fake news and not to be uh, carried seriously and followed seriously. Um, and again, it's, it's the very open nature of the internet and the social media platform, which in most respects is a fantastic benefit for us, but it's a very open, unregulated nature that allows for this form of fake news to be uh, a spread in such voluminous uh, and effective way. That is, the, that is the root cause, I think, of, of this particular problem we're, 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 we're talking about in this panel. But, but we have been singularly unsuccessful in doing this. No, that's I mean, not true. Absolutely not true. In the US, we look at the, uh, off the State Department Office of Public Diplomacy. Um, I don't think you find a person who would argue that this has been a successful enterprise, even though it's been well led. We, even though we, ha we haven't successfully engaged in the way that we need to. I, if we had, we wouldn't need to sit here. Well, the number of people that have been radicalized and, and persuaded to travel to Syria and Iraq from the United States, Western Europe, and if I speak from the regions that I know, have dried up, effectively. Well, surely that's because the military defeat of ISIS, not because of the well, that's, persuaded it's a bad that's, idea. That's your assessment. I might have a different one. I think that's part of it, and I don't think it's as simplistic the as timing that. timing would imply it's more than just part of no, it. No, because it began before uh, the serious military decline of ISIS. I, I agree with you that is certainly a, a, a contributory factor, as indeed a, a more uh, aggressive response by the security and law enforcement agencies, especially in Europe. But I would expect also that the, 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 the counter-narrative is beginning to have some effect. I agree with you. It's, it's very much an uphill battle. I wouldn't call it singularly uh, unsuccessful. I think that's a bit hard on those that are engaged in this. Uh, and it remains a, a very serious challenge. But there are some success that, that we're finding out there. If I could go back to the general. Um, general, do you think you can deter somebody who is prepared to sacrifice their own life and their family's life? One can deter, why not? If uh, <clears throat> there's a proper mechanism in place and uh, if there are uh, courts which can take the scenes, and in our case, I openly admit we had the military courts and about 170 what individuals were convicted and punished. And, you know, there's a number of them given death sentence. You know. Obviously, uh, there, there's still a very large number which is going through the process. And I, I must admit also that uh, you know, uh, this was need of the hour. It was unusual time. So for that uh, unusual, uh, uh, you can say, arrangement was required. Uh, so we did that. And there is deterrence, which, uh, which obviously those who are in the pipeline, those who are gradually getting indoctrinated and all, they, they do get deterred. So I think uh, apart from uh, a kinetic operation, there's a development wrong which is required. And with that, this deterrence has to be in place. And it does work, in my opinion. Education, man, is the most mm -hmm. important place to start to get the counter-narrative. And that can only happen in schools, in mosques, in churches, in social um, gatherings, etc., etc. And using the modern tools, as the terrorists use them to, to convince others to join them, also is, is important. But also, the other thing that is equally important is to try not to, to, to punish 
the, 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 the innocence while you're dealing with the criminals. Uh, and this is also something that, unfortunately, in some cases, hasn't happened. The, the collateral damage has wide, wide effect. On, on, a, on a society or on a group of, of people. So, but what, what are you to do? Um, as the general said, you have to have rigid and, and very enforceable um, uh, conditions under which you operate. But at the same time, you must keep in mind that not to eliminate a terrorist and create 10 others. That is equally important to keep in mind. And that can only happen if there is very strong coordination between the world community mm -hmm. on, on these issues, which unfortunately, until today, I don't think yet exists. It's improving, but it's not there yet. Yes. And de-radicalization as well is important. The young people who go to Syria, for example, you must offer them a chance to come back. And not simply because they went to Syria, they are considered die-hard terrorists and punishable by death or by elimination or whatever. There must be means of inviting them back and using family, using the other social uh, contacts that they may have had uh, can sometimes uh, uh, work. And in the kingdom, there is a re-radicalization -radical, uh, uh, program which is a work in progress. But it's helped in convincing at least a number of these terrorists that what they're doing is wrong and that they must come back and, and work within their society. Not, not to break the leash or mm -hmm. the link with them. Mm -hmm. Give them a way out to come back. Yeah, I see a lot of heads nodding around the, the yes, circle here. Right. I, but I'll, I'll just like to, because you know, about uh, my previous comments, we are running seven de-radicalization centers, and we have about 2,500 individuals. Sabahun is the name of the center, which is in light at the end of the day. So that is, those have been run, 2,500 individuals have come out of that. We involve the families. We have NGOs, everybody is working on it. In fact, we have experienced and we have uh, delivered a number of fields. It is about 3,38,000 families which is over 800,000 people, were moved out of an area. Of, that area was about 8,000 square kilometers. So 8,000 square kilometer area, people were moved out. Then we carried out the operation. And you know, I'm very happy to state that around 90% have gone back you know, to those areas. So we cleared the area, moved them back. And so all this has happened with a theme built better than before, and obviously poverty, education, health, and all these things. You know, we even gave them polio drops, and uh, Robert Gates would rang me up and thank me. So that's that's the type of, you know, whole, that's what I was saying. There's a whole of nation approach required, and uh, there is a full theme behind it. So only then, you know, it's not only a con, it's it's not only an operation. It has to be a concept which deals with with all these dimensions. Only then one can bring down terrorism and control extremism. There's a shocking amount of agreement around the circle here. I think we may need to bring the audience in. But first of all, Jean-Paul. Uh, no, what I want to say is that, uh, of course, we need a real policy. You cannot only go to actions. And this is something, for example, in, in concerning the, uh, the digital issues, to come back to that. Uh, for example, the... Uh, uh, the impact, if we want to have a counter narrative, the impact of somebody who has been deregulated de and who can speak about the, the process under which he was radicalized, it's something which has really an impact. Or, unfortunately, when we have so many victims, uh, some of them can also speak about that, you know, which really gives the sense of, of the acts of, of terrorism. But, as, out of that, we need to have a counter-violent extremist policy. We have to have prevention of policy. As you said, education is, is really something which is important, in which, by the way, the people who are radicalized and who have been de-radicalized have to uh, really be there. The impact is enormous when you have that. So that's where, where we start with the prevention. It's 
you know, it's like a crime at the end. Eh? You, need pre you need the real policy with prevention, and then after that, operation, and then de-radicalization, and the prisons also uh, issues which have to be uh, treated uh, uh, very, very seriously. So all of that, in order to prevent this, uh, what is a subtopic of today, this terrorism and digital connections. Thank you. Um, I'd like to invite any questions or comments from the floor. Yes, please. I think it's a small enough room, you're probably fine. Thank you very, very much for being here today. Um, I, the, the terrorists themselves, you know, could be attributed because of their, their religious fanatics. But I think the role of sympathizers internationally is hugely significant. Why is it that enormous swathes of, of uh, citizens turn a blind eye and a deaf ear to what really could be much more of a pressure and a movement uh, opposing these. So there's religious fanaticism in the terrorists, but surely the sympathizer is less the religious fanatic, but the one complaining or uh, being a victim of corruption in their governments, unhappiness with how they live their lives. So what I'm saying here is that the terrorist is almost a single person compared to what uh, condones the action and allows this to happen on a, on a huge scale. And that leads also to very quick radicalization. Thank you. Cynicism. Yes, Cynicism is the worst tool of these sympathizers. They don't go and do the terrorist act. Mm. <laughs> um, we had uh, uh, the case of, of, of a person in, in the kingdom, much reported in the press, uh, who at one time in his lifetime was a sympathizer, not necessarily of terrorist acts, but of, of, of acts of, of, of opposition, let's say, to established order or to certain uh, uh, ideas and, and, uh, and uh, directions. And uh, he was urging young people to go and, and fight for the rights of, of Muslims to protect themselves, etc., putting it in a halo type of, of approach. And one day, the Ministry of, of, of Interior received a call from this person uh, saying, please, can you stop my son from going across the border into um, an area of, 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 of conflict? And this is a typical way for, for these sympathizers who are willing to see others die for, for certain issues, but not themselves or their loved ones. So you're right. The sympathizers and anybody who, who beats the drum for these terrorists should be included in the, in the way that the, the, the treatment for uh, and, the, and the dealing with the terrorists is undertaken. And, and that cannot Sorry. be done simply by legislation. No. It must be done through a social makeup, the holistic approach that the general was talking about, the whole nation or the whole community participating in it. It, it just depends on, on the particular terrorist phenomena that, that, we, that we have. So in the days when uh, uh, terrorism in Europe was better, more characterized by separatist movements like the IRA in Britain and Ireland and ETA in Spain and France, then there was a cause that, that was capable of being sympathized with, perhaps, among sections of the public. If I compare that with what we have in Europe today, I don't see groundswell of sympathy, at least not natural levels of sympathy, with, with the aims of, uh, certainly not the actions of ISIS. Now, the community of radicalized members or potential members is indeed large and worrying so, but no groundswell sympathy for their actions. I don't see it at all. Uh, two years ago this month, uh, in response to the uh, Charlie Hebdo attacks in Paris, you'll remember, there were millions of people, French people, that came out to the streets to say, je suis Charlie, and, and, and indeed um, copied around Europe in major cities. It's quite a powerful statement, actually, and a natural popular reaction that wasn't stage managed by any politicians. And that's stuck in my mind, I think, at least in, in the region that, that, that uh, I work. So it depends. And once again, we go back to the point about how do you characterize, how do you define terrorism, because there are many different forms. 
I would just draw a distinction there, if I could, between a sympathy with actions of terrorists and, and sympathy with their aspirations. I think even in the case of the ETA and, and the IRA, I don't think there was a great deal of sympathy for their actions. There was sympathy with their aspirations. I think we see much of that today. There's certainly not sympathy with the atrocities committed by Daesh and so on, but certain sympathy with a feeling of um, a community that is that is lost out, uh, a sense of anger against what it, um, the authorities, the world, whoever. So it's there is a, I think one can distinguish between sympathy for actions and, and sympathy for aspirations. But anyway, let me bring in this gentleman right here. Um. Hello. Yeah. I just want to kind of build on what that lady said over there that, um, you know, they need some grounds for recruitment. And uh, maybe, you know, she was talking about injustice or, you know, misgovernance or things like that. But I think there are other things as well. The proxy wars which are being fought around the globe today, what's happening in Syria, what happened in Afghanistan, wars which have nothing to do with those people over there. People are dying and the whole world is watching. And when people watch that injustice, like she's saying, it gives ground for recruiting. And those are the grounds which create those feelings. So. Is it time maybe we should actually raise our voices to the people who are fighting those proxy wars and call a spade a spade? Because that is what is going to you know, add to the recruitment today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Again, I see nodding of heads in response to that. The gentleman behind you. <coughs> My question is for the general and about this tension between fighting the <coughs> Taliban when um, there are sympathizers within the population who may not be in the tens, but maybe in the hundreds of thousands who are supporting them. How do you deal with this sort of tension? How do you go after the Taliban when there are large parts of the population who might be giving them shelter or maybe sympathizing with them and approving what they do? I'm just wondering if you can give us some insight as to how Pakistan dealt or continues to deal with this issue. Yes. May I Please. The circumstances in Pakistan are, uh, are, are, are difficult, there are huge challenges, and we uh, need to understand those challenges. For example, we have uh, over 3 million Afghan refugees in Pakistan for the last over 30 years. We have uh, a 2,400-kilometer border between Pakistan and Afghanistan, which is a porous border. We have intertribal linkages. There are a number of uh, villages which are, you can say, divided villages in a sense that you can, you know, have um, dinner in one uh, house and then have lunch in the other and you'll be on the other side of the border. And then you have, uh, as you said, a lot of people who are, who are inter intermarriages and so the milieu or the uh, environment is pretty difficult. But Pakistan is managing that once we launch this Operation Zarbehaz we decided that we will uh, establish rid of our country, rid of Pakistan, rid of the government in all the areas. So now the rid of the government exists in whole of Pakistan and the border is being managed. Uh, there are difficulties on the other side. There are um, you know, pockets in Afghanistan where there are a lot of uh, uh, all these organizations, a lot of terrorists and the groups are there. And then there's a talk of various tribes and various networks like Afghanis and all. So that all is dependent on the situation in Afghanistan. So we hope and pray. It is our um, you know, brotherly country. And we hope and pray that uh, stability returns to Afghanistan. And ours and Afghan destiny obviously is linked. And I personally feel the moment there is stability in Afghanistan, things would improve. Thank the media, you. ma'am. We haven't talked about the media. Please. They have enormous role to play in either promoting or opposing what is happening in, in the world today. And unfortunately, the sensationalism attracts the media. And these terrorists, they, they aim to, to, to raise the sensational aspects of their acts. <coughs> of their acts. Hence, we see the beheadings, we see the burnings, we see all of that. And the media simply spreads it around. And I think that there is a need for a rethink on what the role of the media should be, not just in, in the West, but throughout the world community. And in addition to that, within the media, 
there is the issue of the double standard that some people feel is applied to their causes or to their interests and their uh, beings. And this is also glorified by, by the media and is something that is pointed to by these terrorists as a means of recruiting others by saying, look what they're promoting here or look what they're saying there and not there. So there is a need also within the counter-terrorism center, I think, for these issues to be thoroughly investigated and researched and, and proposals made to meet the challenges. And, and one more quick comment yes. about uh, various conflicts that are going on in, in, in the world. I personally feel there is a requirement to resolve these conflicts, but that would also, you know, like Kashmir is one, Palestine is one, another conflict. And uh, once we do that, I'm sure, again, it would help in having a better understanding, better harmony in various regions. Thank you. Yeah, Vikram Sigam. Louise, I'm wanting to hear about the nexus between corruption, organized crime, and terrorism. You know, the, you just take it that terrorism cannot function without organized crime. A terrorist cannot walk out with a suicide jacket. He doesn't get explosives off the shelf. He doesn't get transportation, logistics, safe areas. He doesn't get intelligence. This all comes from organized crime, identity documents, etc. Organized crime is fed by corruption. And in many cases, corruption is definitely fosters this organized crime to control areas. Right? We have seen that happening in Pakistan. And we've seen it happening in this thing. But unfortunately, the West does not look at the proceeds of corruption going to the West. Right? I mean, you have the around the Hyde Park, you have most of the biggest crooks in the world living there. You know, we does something about it. Right, because there is no real estate that says you can buy something not over 10,000 pounds in cash. But most of the property is bomb beyond that. You cannot say, can you buy property without declaring the source of your income? Have you declared your tax uh, return or not even tax return, at least your tax registration from the country of origin? So I think we must look at corruption as a figure, as this thing. Go after that. Thank you. Anyone like to comment on that? Yeah. Yes, please, Jean-Paul. Well, uh, not only corruption, but uh, as you said, there is corruption, which is one of the means of organized crime. That's, that's where the, uh, the problem is. And the more and more, especially now with Daesh, uh, you can see the reduction. I, I just take this example. I don't say that it is only that. But with the reduction of the, of the territory, it means less resources. Of course, they have still the resources coming from the taxes, and that, but still they are engaging more and more in, uh, in, the, in organized crime. Um, the diffusion also of, of corruption into societies is something which, of course, diminishes the values. And then, you know, uh, these people who are uh, looking at internet can say, OK, look, Daesh is, is promoting great values, whatever is wrong. but because of the society is not what, is, what it should be. So that's obviously the work against organized crime has to be one of the components. And, and even more, I say, if you attach uh, organized crime with terrorism, it means that you will diminish the, I mean, uh, the value of the people who said, yes, we are, wait, we are fighting for the right cause. You cannot fight for the right cause when you are using these methods of organized crime. I want to take one example key, another one. For example, when they, uh, in Daesh, they uh, request uh, women to join, and they did that and they continue to do it, to join their rank, to support their ranks, to support uh, uh, Daesh, whatever the type of support they want from. You should know that after having, quote, using the services of these women. They sell them again to uh, uh, these networks of, uh, of organized crime. Uh, and these ladies, in that, in that case, are resold, are resold to somebody else. That's, that's so horrible that you can see that 
if we are good enough I think, in terms of digital use to really uh, promote the fact, I mean, pr to, to not promote, to look at the facts and say what they do, and using, uh, for example, in the, even in, in Afghanistan, it's two, $200 million per year that uh, support the Taliban and uh, at Al Qaeda also. So that's where I think we are not good enough. In the, and this is where I really push my, my actions and try to do whatever we have to do in terms of good practices, sharing whatever has to be shared and using the center for promoting these actions. Thank you. There's another important factor here, I agree with you, in the sense that the profile of the terrorists, at least those yes. that were responsible for the attacks that we've seen in Europe, are much more criminally uh, affected, criminally formed by their background. They come up through a gang culture. Uh, many of them have criminal traces, police files on them from drug, low-level drug offenses and so on. We haven't seen that in the past, you know, because we're dealing with a different typology of terrorists compared to the rather more religiously uh, convinced members of Al-Qaeda. We're dealing with different people that are different products of society with their criminal background. And that's important for the way in which we structure our response, going right back to where we started, which is why we have to envisage a more um, ambitious uh, counter-terrorist response that breaks free from the national constrictions. Because uh, we have to find a way of connecting the intelligence world with the police world more and more, because very often the, the, the data, the data about who these people are, where they've come from, and who they're still in touch with, will be as much in a police file, maybe even at a local level, as it will be in the files of the CIA or MI5. And, and that means our response has to be smarter and wider than, than it has been. Can I, uh, we don't have that much time left, and I wonder if I could ask you to think about the future. We've already said we've been slow in countering terrorists, we've been reacting to them. Do you have any sense, do you think about what they might do next, especially in this digital age? We've seen a new tendency is that they tend, certainly the European ones, to be more criminal. What, what do you worry about they're doing next? Cyber warfare is um, available. Mm -hmm. And that is something that terrorists, by their knowledge of the technology of social media and so on, can very much address and use as a tool to enhance their, their, their projects. And I've read in various studies as well, the worry about the more lethal, uh, either radioactive or biological or chemical uh, facilities and capabilities that may be at hand now because of modern technology and the spread of that modern technology throughout the world where it might not be as well protected as in some other places are equally things that we must keep in mind that terrorists will not pre pre prevent themselves from using any means to advance their causes. So they'd be willing to use these issues. I think the ability to hack into systems, you know, even um, very advanced weaponry and those kinds of things is a very real threat. I mean, the and as technology improves, as you have even more sophisticated uh, digital technology in developing weaponry, so the, 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 the possibility that someone can hack into a very sophisticated system and control that, uh, and control that resource in such a way as to do maximum damage somewhere. I think that um, it, 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 it's just the it's a, the, the whole irony of it is that technology is so important in everything and we're making so much progress. But just as we make that progress, you know, the, 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 the weak underbelly, the, 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 obvious, um, uh, the, the obvious problem with that is that we're also, we also have the tendency that somebody somewhere who all he needs to do is to simply get into that system kind of break that system in such a way as to do really great damage. That, 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 that I think, um, might keep us awake at night, you know, because we really need to find ways, perhaps ways of protecting systems more. And um, what we've seen in, in even in the past few months, the past few years, 
shows that you know hacking is becoming you know an uh, even more uh, dangerous business and certainly much more than just hacking into uh, into political into uh, political party systems. I, I think that we should be really worried about the possibilities. I, I, I agree. I think I think a logical extension of some of these groups becoming more and more tech savvy is is something like that. Um, and even if they don't have access to this capability, then they can simply buy it, frankly, on, on the darknet, where there's an enormous trade in cyber criminal technology uh, that, is, that is available. That said, I think attacking the critical national infrastructure, at least of most countries, is, is a tough task, not easily done. And there's something that's not quite as immediate and showy as, you know, firing automatic weapons in, in, in a, in a theatre or in public. So I'm not sure that we'll see that, but I think it's clearly a scenario that we have to be concerned about. I'm also concerned about the extent to which Daesh, for example, has been quite smart in exploiting geopolitical trends. That's, you know, in a way that, that it makes them more political and strategic than, than we've seen in the past. A deliberate, I think, exploitation of the migration crisis in a way that's aggravated the problem, I think, for Western governments in Europe. Um, and they've acted you know, to infiltrate perhaps some of the, the routes uh, and maybe even to infiltrate some of the refugee camps in a way that's had an adverse political effect. And I wonder if that was all part of their, their, their planning. So we are dealing perhaps with a more sophisticated actor in many different ways. And also, I'd like to agree because glorification, in my opinion, is something on which these terrorist organizations thrive. And they, that's why they choose the right moment, the right you know, target and all. And uh, so in that way, maybe in the future, the West you know, the, or the developed countries, they will have problem in a sense as far as the cyber is concerned. If it has to be something, it has to be spectacular in nature. And uh, I hope it doesn't happen. And it would be very unfortunate but that's that's what uh, they have always been trying. Uh, so that 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 would be something we, one can see with this. Uh, but there is a requirement to have filters. There is a requirement to control the technology in a manner that it does not get into the hands. It's easier said than done. But there has to be something done about it. And I personally feel the international community needs to sit together, develop a counter narrative, and develop, as far as this digital age is concerned, develop some system that we have a check on it. Well, I think we're out of time. So if I can summarize where we are, there's notwithstanding the fact that we have a very distinguished panel from very different parts of the world, representing very different experiences, there's a, an enormous amount of agreement here that, that terrorists have indeed been very uh, fast and agile in using the digital age to communicate, to recruit, and, um, and to propagandize, uh, and that the best hope for an effective counter-terrorist campaign is one that has to marshal on national terms both the state and civil society and the private sector, but if it is to be effective, it has also has to be international, and that it's incumbent upon us to figure out a way to construct a convincing counter-narrative uh, to counter the, the ideologies being trafficked by these groups. Um, looking into the future, we're worried about their use of, of uh, they're becoming more tech savvy, uh, using potentially using weapons of mass destruction, potentially hacking into weapon systems or through links with um, organized crime, even, even buying them. So um, I'm trying desperately to seek a positive note in which yes. to end this. Um, yes. <laughs> I want to give you the positive Go ahead. note. Because everybody agrees on the, on the threat and yes. the future. But we are working on that. And we are working with the world on this issue. Cyber security already. We have a global agenda council. We are producing uh, many uh, elements, especially to trying to find what kind of core actions have to be made. Because uh, in order to, 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 to leave the freedom that you were speaking, President, the freedom of speech, the privacy, etc., we are working on that. And uh, hopefully, uh, uh, among all these elements of the societies, uh, again, civil society, companies, and governments, and international organizations, we can find a solution at least at the same pace 
this is a hope that we can have that the terrorist organizations run their, their dramatic uh, terrorist actions. Thank you. Well, on that positive note, I'd like to invite you to join me in thanking our panelists for being with you.